Okay, so now it's time to talk about cellular energetics, uh, how energy moves through a cell. And uh, we're going to start this discussion first with photosynthesis, um, because really it's kind of the foundational process that energetically keeps life going on Earth. So you may have heard about photosynthesis from some grade school experience, but photosynthesis is all about um, making uh, chemical energy from solar energy. It's a transformation process. Really, the word making is not appropriate. It's, it's more appropriately stated photosynthesis is a transformation of solar energy to chemical energy. So the organisms that can do this kind of thing are called autotrophs. They make their own food. Heterotrophs, which is what humans are, and uh, giraffes and fungi and bugs cannot make their own food and so um, have to eat other life forms to survive. So um, one of the foundational concepts in this chapter before we dive into photosynthesis is understanding the universal energy molecule known as uh, ATP. ATP is an energy molecule used by cells. Um, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Um, ATP is really not to store long-term energy. It, it does store energy, but only for, for brief moments. Uh, basically what cells do is they bond uh, a phosphate molecule onto a molecule called ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. And when you add a phosphate to ADP, ADP has two phosphates. When you add a phosphate to a molecule with two phosphates, it then has three phosphates. ATP is that molecule. Adenosine triphosphate has three phosphates. Why would a cell do this? Why would a cell put a phosphate onto an ADP to make an ATP because ATP is the energy molecule that really all of the enzymes and organelles in a cell use for fuel. You may remember from a previous discussion in the active transport pump, sodium, the sodium potassium pump uses phosphate from ATP to actually ch change shape and move sodium and potassium through the cell membrane. Um, all your organelles in your cells actually run on ATP energy. Removing that last phosphate is, a, is an energetically good thing to do. So what your cells are in the business of doing is, is taking the energy from food and using it to bond a phosphate, which looks like this, PO4H or HPO4, bonding it onto adenosine diphosphate. This is adenosine diphosphate here. This is the adenosine part here. And here's the two phosphates. By adding this phosphate onto the end here, you get ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. One, two, three. This molecule here is basically a handle with a nice energy cap on the end. The phosphate right there is a little cap of energy. And you're going to hear about this in the chapter, about how ATP is used as an energy intermediate. It picks up energy from one place and drops it off in another. It doesn't really store energy long term like fat uh, or lipids do or even complex carbohydrates like starch does. Instead, ATP stores energy for brief moments. So now let's talk uh, briefly about photosynthesis or uh, at least the history of photosynthesis. Plants are notorious for converting the energy of sunlight into chemical bond energy and the preferred molecule that's produced by photosynthesis is basically sugars. From the sugars then, plants make starches. The first that we have any information on photosynthesis research is back in the 17th century in the 1600s, which is when cells were discovered. A scientist named Jean van Helmont took a willow sprig. Willow sprigs are good candidates for growing from uh, branch cuttings. If you have a willow and you want another willow, if you cut a branch, a small branch, uh, shove it in the ground and water it, it'll grow into another willow tree. And that's been known for eons. So what uh, Helmont did was he took a willow sprig by cutting it off a tree. He weighed it. It was 150 pounds. It was a pretty good sized branch. He stuck it in a pot of soil and he had weighed the soil. What he wanted to know was where does a tree get its mass? At the end of uh, more than a year of growth, the soil lost almost no mass 
but the willow sprig grew enormously. In fact, it, I'm sorry, it grew 75 kilograms. And his conclusion was that the uh, willow sprig gained mass from water. Now, that, it did gain some mass from the water that he watered the pot with, but only about 20%. 80% of that mass came from the air, but Van Helmont didn't know about carbon dioxide in the air and about plants removing it. And so as a result, he missed out on that, but he was the first scientist to try to explore how plants, you know, gain weight, how they get bigger. Joseph Priestley, in the 18th century, found that plants could actually renew the air in a jar with a candle that had depleted the air in the jar. So if you take a candle, light it, and then put a jar over the top of it, the candle goes out. They said that the, the air was depleted. They didn't know exactly what happened. Today we know that the oxygen in the air is used up and the carbon dioxide is built up. What he found was that if you stuck a plant in that air, that the air changed and you could then again light a candle in it. Now he didn't know what was going on chemically, but we now know that the plant's removing carbon dioxide from the air as long as it's in the sun, and it's making oxygen, and that's the renewal process. But he, Joseph Priestley didn't know about all that stuff. Ingenhouse, a few years, years later, showed that Priestley's renewing process only occurred uh, if you gave the, the plant light. So these are the little jars that Priestley used. He had small plants inside of little glass jars that he was doing all of his experiments with. Uh, and this is a willow tree, a typical weeping willow that uh, Van Helmont could have used if, for his experiment. Now, you're going to need to know the overall equation for photosynthesis. And what it says is that six molecules of carbon dioxide plus six molecules of water form one molecule of sugar and six molecules of oxygen. It's like a shake and bake process. Uh, and in this animation here, I'm, that's exactly what I'm trying to show. I'm trying to take this equation and summarize it. So here comes the water in, here comes the oxygen coming out, and then some transfer was made here, and then this thing called the dark reaction sucks in the carbon dioxide and spits out sugar. This is a product of photosynthesis, the oxygen was a product of photosynthesis. Water is a reactant, here it is. Oxygen is a product, here it is. Carbon dioxide is a reactant, here it is. Sugar is a product, glucose, here it is. So what I'm trying to tell you here in this animation is that photosynthesis is divided into two parts, a light phase or a light reaction and a dark phase or a dark reaction. And, um, and that's what we're going to dive into next. So the light phase actually uses water. The light phase uses the water and makes the oxygen. The dark phase uses carbon dioxide and makes the sugar. Why does there have to be a light and a dark phase? Well, it turns out the light phase actually is what catches the light and transfers the energy of the light in the form of hydrogen atoms and ATP over to the dark reaction so the dark reaction can actually produce uh, sugar. So hydrogen atoms, as you may know from the Hindenburg story, store a lot of energy. ATP, you just found out, stores energy. The light reaction's job is to capture solar energy and store it in the form of hydrogen atoms which are stripped off of water, water's got H's, and ATP energy, there it is, ATP and hydrogen atoms are sent over. Oxygen is a waste product of the light reaction. The dark reaction takes carbon dioxide, the hydrogen atoms, and the ATP, and it cranks out the sugar here. So let's talk for a brief uh, few moments about sunlight. So what is sunlight? It says autotrophs can carry out photosynthesis, heterotrophs cannot and must absorb or eat food. The white light of sunlight is actually a mixture of the colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. When your eye receives all the colors simultaneously, you see white. If, you only see, if, if your eye only receives one kind of wavelength, then you only see one color. So if your eye receives 500 nanometer light, you're seeing this uh, far green color. If you see 550 nanometer wavelength light, you're seeing green color. This is the visible spectrum right here. So it turns out that um, each color of light differs by the, its wavelength. It turns out that light travels in waves. You may remember this from physics. And that different colors of light have different wavelength. 
uh, uh, wavelength is the length of a wave. So when something's traveling in a wave, the wave length can be measured. And it turns out that the visible light with the shortest wavelength is violet, and the one with the longest wavelength is red. So the color of a substance is determined by the color that it reflects. But photosynthesis is all about colors absorbed. And as it turns out, chlorophyll is most fond of absorbing purple, violet, orange, and red. Chlorophyll does not like to absorb green and yellow. So the reason plants look green and yellow is because the chlorophyll inside is absorbing all the other colors except for violet, I'm sorry, except for uh, green and yellow. It's reflecting green and yellow, and that's what comes back to our eyes, and that's how plant leaves appear green. Now, what in a plant is actually doing this absorbing and reflecting? Well, those are pigments. Pigments are chemicals that have uh, a color behavior. They do something with colors. They either re they reflect some colors and absorb others. The main pigment of photosynthesis is called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is notorious for absorbing red, orange, blue, and violet light. It reflects the green and the yellow. The way chlorophyll is built is it's got a fatty acid tail or a hydrocarbon tail, and that's what these are here. Those are the flagpoles that anchor the chlorophyll into a cell membrane. This part of the chlorophyll is actually wedged in the core of the thylakoid membranes of a chloroplast. We'll get to that in a minute. And this part is actually the flag section that waves out uh, in the stroma uh, of the thylakoid. And the job of this part right here is to catch the sunlight. This part is just to anchor. This is the part that catches the sunlight. This is chlorophyll A and this is chlorophyll B, and they're almost identical except for a couple of atoms right here at the top. Chlorophyll B has got a couple of atoms that chlorophyll A is missing. Otherwise, the two molecules are identical. Um, but because they have a couple of different atoms, chlorophyll A absorbs slightly different light than chlorophyll B. Now, before we dive into, you know, the specifics of photosynthesis, you have to know how a chloroplast is built. Photosynthesis only takes place in the chloroplasts of uh, plant cells. It also takes place inside of photosynthetic bacteria, but they are basically like a chloroplast. So what is a chloroplast? A chloroplast has two phospholipid membranes. So it's actually two phospholipid membranes around the outside here. And then on the inside, there's these green discs that are stacked on top of each other. They're green because they've got the chlorophyll on them. These molecules are on these green disks. This section, the flagpole section, anchors the chlorophyll into the membranes of these thylakoids. This section sticks off the surface and catches the light. So the green part is all studded with chlorophyll. The yellowish part that's floating around the green part, that's called the stroma. Now that's where the dark reaction takes place. The green part is where the light reaction takes place. So in the previous little animation, the light reaction was taking place on these green disks called thylakoids. A stack of green disks is called a grana. hate to put too many words in here, but this is a grana. Each disk is a thylakoid. And the yellowish stuff is where the sugar actually gets made. That's the stroma. It turns out that the grana supplies the energy for the stroma to make the sugar. The grana is where the light reaction is taking place, where water is being broken down to produce hydrogen, atoms and some ATP energy and in the stroma carbon dioxide is being consumed and along with the energy of the hydrogen atoms and the uh, ATP sugar is made. So this is a quick little schematic summary. The light reactions take in light, they take in water, they kick out oxygen as a waste product, they in addition they kick out ATP and hydrogen atoms. This NADPH that's referring to the hydrogen atoms. NADP is just like a pickup truck that carries hydrogen. Um, and the hydrogen then is used with carbon dioxide to make sugar in the dark reaction. The dark reaction is also called the Calvin cycle. It's named after Melvin Calvin who discovered you know, the reactions that occur there. Now, um, it turns out that the way the light reaction works is light strikes chlorophyll and that energizes some of its electrons. 
And the electrons get really excited and they jump off the chlorophyll and they jump onto other molecules called electron acceptors. Ultimately, the electron acceptors form a conga line and they keep passing the electrons down until they finally get to NADP+, which picks them up and the electrons are actually carried as hydrogen atoms. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, but when an NADP, which is like a pickup truck, picks up an electron, it also picks up a hydrogen ion floating around. It's like a piece of lint on the floor. And when you put a hydrogen ion and an electron together, you get a hydrogen atom. And so the NADP carries hydrogen atoms from the light reaction to the dark reaction to build sugar. So the light reactions. Light reactions are called light reactions because they depend on light. What they do is they produce oxygen gas and they convert ADP to ATP and NADP+, plus, which is the pickup truck, to NADPH plus H+. Plus. That's a pickup truck with a bed full of hydrogen. Now, the purpose of the light reaction is to capture the energy of sunlight and make some energy storing compounds, which are ATP and the NADPH. The light reaction takes place on the thylakoids. That's where the chlorophyll is, and that's where all the electron carriers are. Um, it, it, the light reaction consists of two photosystems, two clusters of chlorophyll. The first cluster of chlorophyll is called photosystem 1, and the second cluster type is called photosystem 2. And these photosystems are scattered throughout the thylakoids, of the chloroplast. So every thylakoid has multiple photosystem 1 clusters and multiple photosystem 2 clusters. The way the two work is photosystem 2 gets hit by light. That causes it to split water, rip the electrons out of it, and pass them to photosystem 1. When photosystem 1 gets hit by light, it gets its electrons energized that it received from photosystem 2, and it passes them to NADP so that they'll be carried to the dark reaction. So this says here, photosystem two transfers electrons to photosystem one. As that happens, and this, just gets, this gets complicated, protons get pumped. I'll show you in the animation for in a minute. It's as the electrons are flying along, they do a little work and they pump some protons and that helps to, 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 to transfer some light energy into chemical energy. But ultimately the electrons move from water to photosystem two to photosystem one to NADP so that the NADP can be carrying them, the electrons, to the uh, dark reaction. Um, now, here's how it looks, you know, if from an artistic rendition. And by the way, Daniel Arnon in 1973, I think, got the Nobel Prize for discovering the reactions of the light phase of photosynthesis. Uh, so this, this is to his credit. Now, here's how the way this, here's how this works. Here's photosystem two. Here's photosystem one. When light hits photosystem two, here's the light zapping in, electrons get energized and they get ready to move towards photosystem one. For that to happen, water has to be broken down by photosystem two, and that's what supplies the electrons so that the electrons can move. Now, as the electrons move from photosystem two to photosystem one, they actually pick up, they grab some protons. And as they're moving along towards photosystem one, they throw them from the stroma into the interior of the thylakoid. So protons are moving to the inside of the thylakoid as a result of this electron movement. On photosystem one, when light hits it, the electrons that it received from photosystem two are energized again, and they're moved to NADP. NADP here is picking up the electrons and it's becoming NADPH because it picks the electrons up with a proton floating around. Now, you may wonder, why are there protons floating around and why are they getting moved? Well, if you recall, back when I talked about acids and bases, wherever you have water, you're going to have protons and you're going to have hydroxide ions. That is the nature of acids and bases. What photosynthesis is doing here is it's taking advantage of something that's already floating around and it's moving something that's already floating around from one side of a membrane to another. Why? There's a special enzyme called ATP synthase that can use protons to spin and crank out ATP from ADP and phosphate. Now, this enzyme is not fully understood, but what it can do is it receives phosphate and ADP, and when it gets hydrogen ions from the inside of a thylakoid, it spins, and it somehow bonds, using that spinning energy, it bonds the phosphate on the ADP to form ATP. So, 
that's the light reaction of photosynthesis. Here it is animated. Here we are. The lights go on. Electrons go from water through photosystem 2 to photosystem 1. From there, they go to NADP. Okay, let's look at it again. Here come the, the electrons. As the electrons move between the two photosystems, they pump protons. Look at it. Here come the protons. The protons are used to make ATP. It's the same thing we talked about before, looking at it in a different way. Light striking the photosystems moves electrons, and as the electrons move, protons get pumped. In the end, the electrons end up being dumped on NADP so that they can be carried to the dark reaction. And the protons that get pumped by the moving electrons, they're used to make ATP, which in turn are also used by the dark reaction to make sugar. Complicated, but absolutely amazing, because here what we have is uh, sort of a solar cell. It's like a solar um, panel on a calculator, the, allowing the calculator to run on sunlight. Now, the dark reaction. Dark reactions don't need to happen in the dark. They just don't need light directly. But what they absolutely have to have is the ATP and, they, and the NADPH. Without that, they can't work. Where do they get these? From the light reaction, which incidentally only works in the light. So the dark reaction usually only runs while sunlight is streaming down. But the dark reaction doesn't actually directly use sunlight. It uses the products of the light reaction, which uses sunlight. Now, what the dark reaction does is it combines carbon dioxide with a five-carbon sugar. Now, carbon dioxide is a one-carbon molecule. When you add a one-carbon molecule to a five-carbon molecule, you make a six-carbon molecule. In this case, though, the six-carbon molecule cracks into two three-carbon sugars. The enzyme that does this is famous. It's called Rubisco. Rubisco's job on this planet is to catch CO2, stick it onto RUBP, which is a five carbon sugar, to produce PGA, which are little three carbon sugars. The PGA then, in the most important biochemical step on Earth, is converted to PGAL. Why? PGAL is a very convertible molecule. It can be used to build almost anything from amino acids to uh, nucleic acids. So, but PGA is not so versatile. So, what this reaction is all about, the most important reaction on Earth, is the products of the light reaction, which are NADPH plus H plus and ATP, are used to convert PGA, which is this, to PGAL, which is this. Look at the difference between the two. PGA has, this is a carbon, this is an oxygen and an oxygen and an H. PGAL, here's a carbon. There's the double bonded oxygen, but there's no O here. There's a direct connection here from the carbon to the H. That's huge. This cluster of atoms right here is biochemically very useful. This cluster of atoms is biochemically fairly worthless. What photosynthesis does is it converts a worthless cluster of atoms to a worthwhile cluster of atoms using power from the light reaction. Now here is a simple actually not so simple, schematic of what's going on uh, during uh, photosynthesis. So if you'll take a really close look now, here is a molecule called RUBP. RUBP is called ribulose biphosphate. This is a phosphate. This is a phosphate. Here's the ribulose. One, two, three, four, five black balls. Each black ball is a carbon. This is a five-carbon sugar, and it's got two phosphates on it. Hence the name ribulose biphosphate. When it reacts with CO2 by the action of this enzyme, Rubisco, you know, Rubisco's got an active site, and the active site can fit RUBP and CO2. Remember, energy of activation is lowered. These two molecules react together, and what they form are two little molecules of PGA. This is PGA, and this is PGA. <coughs> what happens to the PGAs? Well, they are combined together to make sugar, but they can't do that until the PGA is converted to PGAL. That uses ATP and hydrogen from the light reaction. By using ATP and hydrogen from the light reaction, this PGA becomes this PGAL. 
glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or G3P is PGAL, P G A L. This molecule can be recycled back into the starting RUBP, or more importantly, see the arrow coming out? It forms, I'm sorry, uh, th this animation or this picture doesn't show it. This can actually be converted to sugar. This molecule right here can be turned, if two molecules of PGA are combined together, it makes one molecule of glucose. So this is a very versatile molecule right here that uh, plants are making by photosynthesis. The direct product of the dark reaction is actually not glucose. It's actually PGAL, which is used to make glucose. Now here's another animation of just the dark reaction. What it does is the dark reaction takes, let's wait until this starts over, RUBP and CO2, combines them together to make PGA. Here's the PGA. Hydrogen and ATP is used to make PGAL. The PGAL is used, you saw the sugar here, and recycle some RUBP. So here's the PGAL here. Watch what happens to it. The PGAL is used to make sugar, and it also makes some RUBP. Why? Because the RUBP is used to capture more carbon dioxide, to make more PGA, to make more PGAL, so that some sugar can get made, but also so that RUBP can get recycled to catch some more CO2 and keep the cycle going. So the dark reaction actually kicks out glucose as a product as long as carbon dioxide is coming in, that's here, and energy from the light reaction is coming in. Here is the summary of overall photosynthesis in its entirety. Here it is now, lights on, photosystem 2, transferring electrons to photosystem 1 on the way protons are getting pumped. The protons are being shuttled over to make ATP. Meanwhile, the electrons are being picked up by these NADP carriers, and you'll notice right here at this step, PGA is being converted to PGAL. Okay, here's the PGAL. It's used to make sugar and recycle some RUBP. Over here in the dark reaction, the CO2 and the RUBP make PGA, but the PGA cannot be converted to PGAL until hydrogen and ATP become available from the light reaction. So this is the overall process of, of photosynthesis. On the left is the light reaction. Using water, That's that was right here, it produces oxygen waste product, but it cranks out ATP that you see here and hydrogen atoms that you see here so that the dark reaction can make sugar. So here's the water. Here's the oxygen waste. Here's the ATP and the hydrogen that it's cranking out. The dark reaction takes in CO2, which was here, uses RUBP to make the PGAs. They're converted to PGAL using energy from the light reaction. The PGAL then is used to produce glucose and recycle more RUBP to catch more CO2. And the cycle goes on. So when sunlight is hitting a plant, there is just a lot of stuff happening in those leaves. In every plant leaf on earth, this process is going on. And this is the process that puts food on your plate so that you do not starve. Um, this is critically important to the planet. Without photosynthesis, we are all dead in the water. All food that you have consumed in your life is coming from this process. Generally speaking, on wheat, corn, rice, and a few other uh, vegetable and fruit plants that are in the, the human uh, food chain. So photosynthesis is an incredibly important process on Earth. It's cranking out sugar which is a necessary commodity for all life. What we're going to talk about next in respiration is how the sugar gets used by a mitochondria to crank out ATP so that your organelles can actually do their work.